this one is um, also what's called a fit for 25B. And, and what really what that means is, as I was saying before, so soybean oil and corn oil are basically your oils. Generally, oils are used for sub suffocants, which means they coat the bug and it basically keeps it from breathing and it kills it in that fashion. And then there's soap. Everybody kind of knows what soap. Soap is also sort of a um, fatty acid that lowers surface tension. And then vanillin is an extract made from the vanilla bean. The downside of citric acid is it can build up in the soil. And as it says here, applying of citric acid uh, can make the environment unsuitable for plants. So, but anything with oils always concerns me too because of phytotoxicity. They claim that it has no phytotoxicity, but they do make a claim um, in their literature that um, after two hours of application, it'll soak into the plant and give longer protection for like 12 days. Have you ever wondered what's in Pure Crop One, the insecticide and fungicide? Well, you're here with Holt Crowley and Mark Bowell on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook. Make sure to hit the notifications for future videos like this. If you haven't checked out our $2.99 membership, make sure to do so. We have over 110 growers ready and willing to help you grow. Let's go ahead and get into it. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. So I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Holt. Uh, first off, Holt, can you please introduce yourself? Tell us what company you're with. And then also, just because, like I've already said, Holt has one of the highest level of integrities I've ever met around the pesticide fungicide arena, which is there's so much information there, but it's a very untapped, uh, untapped, unspoken uh, area. So because of Holt and his high level of integrity, I've actually started to ask him to come onto the channel and we're going to begin to break down one pesticide and or fungicide at a time so that you guys have a full understanding of what you're putting on your plants and the proper application for these pesticides and fungicides. So Holt, please introduce yourself to the channel. Sure, thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Holt Crowder. I work for a company called Organishield, and Organishield happens to be a pest control or an IPM, and it's a EPA registered uh, IPM, which means it's a little different than some of the other ones in that we actually had to prove our results and the EPA gave us a registration versus some of the other products that um, they may be on exemption list with their ingredients. Very cool, I absolutely love that. Holt, uh, can you please go ahead and share your screen and walk us through the first pesticide that you'd like to tell us more information about? Sure, sure. The, the first one we're going to go over is, let me pop it up on the screen here, is called Pure Crop One. And this one, uh, feel free, Mark, to, to cut in and ask me any questions as I'm going through this. This one is um, also what's called a fit for 25B. And, and what really what that means is, as I was saying before, those products, there's a list of fit for 25B that has, it's really what your ingredients are. So it's ingredients that are considered organic ingredients that are all natural or something along those lines that have shown some bug um, or pest control of efficacy, which means efficacy just means that they tend to kill some of the bugs some of the time. And so they don't have to go through some of the more rigorous ones with some of your chemicals or even organic ones like like ours uh like organic shield that was organic but uh we still had to prove uh, the value of it to the epa so these are just ones off this list it gives them a little bit more flexibility but generally most of them like the one we're about to talk about with pure crop um, a lot of them have oils in them a couple of them have some other things too but first let's talk about pure crop i find this one very interesting um if we look at the active ingredients here you can see soybean oil is 10 percent corn oil is five percent then the other ingredients are water, guar gum, glycerin, citric acid, soap, and vanillin. So we'll need to kind of break down a little bit about these. Um, so soybean oil and corn oil are basically your oils. Generally, oils are used for sub suffocants, which means they coat the bug and it basically keeps it from breathing and it kills it in that fashion. Then the other ingredients in this particular one, water, everybody knows what water is. Guar gum is actually used in a lot of uh, cooking things as a binder. So I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions here because I'm not their chemist on this, but I'm assuming some of the guar gum was used as a binding to hold everything together. Glycerin, glycerin is actually a surfactant. Um, a lot of people know of glycerin in their cosmetics and uh, there's glycerin soap, there's some glycerin used in cooking, but glycerin usually lowers the, the surface tension of water so that actually it coats a little bit better. Citric acid, uh, citric acid is, people know of, of um, it's kind of like vitamin C, but it doesn't, it's not quite like sorbic acid, it's vitamin C, citric acid, is a little bit different. It is also, 
normally you find it in uh, lemons, limes, things like that, but most of the citric acid used is a fermentation process. So they ferment that to make it. And then there's soap. Everybody kind of knows what soap. Soap is also sort of a um, fatty acid that lowers surface tension. And then vanillin is an extract made from the vanilla bean. I'm not sure what they're using that for. Um, it might be for a little bit of smell or something because we don't really know the percentages of these ones across the bottom. Uh, we do know it's 10% corn oil, or sorry, 5% corn oil, 10% soybean oil. Um, so of all the oil ones I've looked at so far, I haven't personally used this one. Um, I find this one a little more interesting because of the process they went through uh, and they nanoparticle the, the oils in there. They claim that it's day of harvest safe and maybe for most of your crops that you're going to eat and everything, it probably is. I, I, I basically call into question anything that's oil that you put in that late in the harvest on something that you're going to set on fire, that you're going to smoke or inhale. Um, so you know, as we talk about more things, you'll hear me refer to oils and I kind of usually oils are, I just, I'm not really the biggest fan of oils because you can't use them very late in your uh, marijuana harvest as a general rule. And so the thought with this one is this one may be really good if you're doing on your vegetables or something like that. But let, let me go back to a couple of ingredients. So citric acid though, one of the things citric acid does, it has some properties to kill fungicide, to kill funguses and things of that nature. It has a pH of about four. Okay, so here's citric acid, and it, it has a pH below four. Um, so, you know, it, it, my concern with citric acid, and they may have a very little amount in there, so it might not be a big deal. But um, I just pulled this up, citric acid on plants. This is Google, so you can search it for yourself if you want to, you know, back up what I'm saying. But anyway, most plants, optimal growth, if we know in the marijuana world, is 5.5 to 7.5 is where you want to be. A lot of people say 5.5 five to 6.5, five, but you understand the range. So citric acid, uh, the, the downside of citric acid is it can build up in the soil. And as it says here, um, you know, applying enough citric acid, sorry, applying enough citric acid uh, can make the environment unsuitable for plants. So something to be always concerned with citric acid is, is that thing that you want to make sure the pH is right. But I always worry about it staying in the substrate. Uh, you know, if you're reusing your cocoa or reusing your rock wool or reusing your soil or whatever, that it can actually build up. It takes a little bit of time to break down. Um, I think there's somewhere around uh, six to 18 months, depending on how it binds into your uh, soil. And also if it's stuck in your soil, then when you add water back in, it's going to, it's going to change the pH of your uh, root environment. So let me go back to the pure crop again. It's, um, all, it's always in the fine print, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of times you'll find things in the fine print. We just don't know what percentage of is citric acid, but I've, I'm seeing that. And um, the other two products we're going to talk about also have a little bit of in it. It's also sort of used as a um, stabilizer or to prevent um, fungus or, or mold buildup because it definitely will, uh, you know, kill mold. So I would say on its own, it might be really good as a fungicide. You just really want to be careful with it. But anyway, so pure crop is something I, I find very fascinating because they nanoparticled it. Uh, it takes about two ounces per gallon of clean water. But anything with oils always concerns me too because of phytotoxicity. They claim that it has no phytotoxicity, but they do make a claim um, in their literature that um, after two hours of application, it'll soak into the plant and give longer protection for like 12 days. Well, the way I kind of look at oils are that oils are trying to coat the bug to suffocate the bug. Um, you want to, you know, stop its breathing where it cannot no longer breathe and die. But, you know, you spray the oils on there and they can build up at some point. They start to build up and they either soak in the plant or you just have a lot of oil in your plant. So I used to call this the spray and pray method because you're going to spray it and you're going to pray that it gets all the bugs. But, um, and then say more bugs come back and then you're spraying again. And so you're starting to just you know, add oil after oil after oil, to me just can be a sort of a dangerous thing when you're really wanting to, on the cannabis plant, especially if you're doing extractions, you're going to be extracting the cannabis oils and you want to be able to do that without having other oils. You don't want soybean oil or corn oil or whatever the oil happens to be. Also, there is a concern, uh, they make the claim because they nanoparticle it that it doesn't do this, but usually oils, you have to worry about the stomata. And if you're familiar with the stomata, that's sort of how a gas exchange happens on the underside of the leaves. And that's where the gas goes in back. So if you have oil, you can imagine that it can possibly coat that in there. And then if, and then also if the, your lights are on, that's why a lot of the oils you'll see and some of the other ones we're going to go through, we're going to say, you know, under this certain temperature, have it under a certain temperature or with the lights off or spray in the evening or something like that. Well, the reason being is 
it's an oil. So if you can imagine putting suntan oil on you, well, the sun, the oil makes the sun refract and be more intense and it'll burn you. So that's called phytotoxicity um, on a plant that the oil can burn it. That's why people you know, always turn their lights off if they spray the traditional oils. Is there any questions on that one, Mark? Though that's kind of most yes. of what I have really just looking at exactly what is on there right it's like berries spinach yeah. grapes to uh tomatoes vegetables orientals something you don't eat citrus so it has a shell uh tree nuts has a shell fruit trees has a shell kiwi i probably wouldn't even use it for a kiwi because it has a soft a soft body and i can see it probably absorbed through it and even the spinach i i could see it washing off but it, it probably would penetrate the and and then they have at the end hops and hops and hemp and yeah. i find that to be really interesting too because it's like oh Let's just throw that on the label and and add it into a new market, you know. And I kind of see that. That's why it's at the end. That's what, I'm just imagining. It, I would. I wonder what the old label would have looked like. Yeah, I, yeah. Probably. I don't know. Um, but as, as far as you know, uh, field crops and things, I could see this being beneficial. It just depends on when you spray it. Most oils, the studies I've seen, stay in the plant for at least thirty to forty-five to sixty days when they soak in. They even make the claim that this one soaks in and stays at least 12 days and gives protection. I'm not sure how it gives protection, but they also make a claim around beneficials versus sap sucking or bugging, uh, you know, plants or bugs that eat, plant, eat on plants. Those are the sap sucking bugs. And they say that it will kill those because it messes up um, the way they digest versus uh, your beneficials insects. I'm not really sure how they've nailed that particular thing of, you know, if it's a ladybug or something like that, that eats aphids or something like that, that it doesn't uh, seem to hurt those. I'm not really sure how they make that claim, but there again, they don't have to necessarily prove their claim because they're not an EPA registered. They're a fit for 25B exemption. I don't know if it's got it on here or not. Let's see. Yeah, here it is right here on the bottom. It's fit for 25, fit for Protection for section B25. That's what I mean by the 25B. If you guys look that up, you'll 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 see what I'm talking about. So essentially, they're not EPA registered, and so sometimes you can usually tell. There's a they have a nice standard form on there, but a lot of times I can tell the ones that are targeted in the marijuana world have cartoonish type labeling because when you're an EPA registered, you know everybody knows how the government likes to control things. So they control your font, your size, everything that you have on your label is, is has to be. Um, you know, signed off by the EPA. These guys did not have to have anything signed off because they're claiming because of these ingredients are considered organic and they're on this particular list, the fit for 25B list, they don't have to basically prove or back up that it does what they say it does. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm just saying that how well does it, that, that could be the question. And then, you know, the thing oils always go back to, but that's pretty much my thoughts on pure crop one. I don't, let me, let me pull up there. Let's see, here's their SDS. So I kind of went through some of these we're on here with our, yeah, I think we've already covered all this citric acid. Yep. Yeah, we've already covered that part. So that's just their SDS. Oh, that was absolutely amazing. And ladies and gentlemen, you have to make a decision. What type of pesticide or fungicide you're going to be putting on your crop and just take into consideration what you're growing. Okay. And I think this is, we're not saying that pure crop is bad. We're not saying it's great. What we're saying is you have to be thoughtful around its application and the types of crops you're growing. And if you're growing an herb or you're growing a soft body, it might not be something that's ideal because at the end of the day, those, those are more difficult to wash off. Harder body shells might be a little bit easier at the end of the day. So just be thoughtful around what you're doing. Um, yeah, I'm not, I mean, these are somewhat my competitors that we're going to go over, but are, we're all selling in the same space. I don't really want to poo-poo on them because everything has its place. Um, everything has its ups and downs and, and benefits to it. And so there are some benefits here, but at the same time, you know, some of these things, I, you know, here's the ingredients. We don't know exactly how much of the inert ingredients they have in here. In some respects, you could almost make your own of some of these, these products we're going to go over, because if you know what's in it, and once you figure out the ratios, you can make your own and make it even cheaper, possibly, if you went down that path. Well, this is why I've asked you to come onto the channel because you have one of the highest level integrities I've actually ever met in this industry. Thank so you. guys, you're welcome, brother. So ladies and gentlemen, please remember to like, share, and subscribe only on Perfect Gardens TV. Have a great grow, everyone. Real quick, to, just yep. to ask real fast. So you switch from a aerobic to an anaerobic to an aerobic uh, yeah. T. And you're the third person in 12 years I've heard do this. And it's really interesting. And 